Hi, my name is Ron Belak, and we're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about strategies for fishing high mountain lakes in Colorado. First, a little bit about myself. I've fished the Colorado backcountry as an adult for over 40 years. And in that time, I've fished about 600 different high lakes in Colorado. I've also written about 75 magazine articles on fly fishing, mostly for Colorado Outdoors magazine. What you're watching right now is a synopsis, a very brief synopsis of my 2018 book entitled Fly Fishing Colorado's Backcountry. It contains strategies for fishing the high lakes and the small streams. If you're interested in learning where to fish, my 2021 book is entitled The Fishing Guide to 800 High Lakes in Colorado. Both of these books can be obtained through a link on my website, which will take you to my printer, Book Baby. They'll take your order and ship you a copy. Okay, that's enough advertising. Let's get on with the presentation. We're gonna talk about three topics. We're gonna talk about fishery management, seasonal strategies, and entomology of the high lakes. Let's start with how the fish got into the high lakes in the first place because originally these lakes, probably 90% of them had no trout in to start. However, people started to stock them as soon as they moved to Colorado. They horse packed up a variety of different species of trout into these lakes and by 1900, many of the high lakes had already been stocked. In the 1950s, the lakes started to be stocked from the air and today, Colorado Parks and Wildlife airily stocks many of the high lakes with one inch fingerling cutthroat. And they do this every two to three years or so. They stock these high lakes with cutthroat because cutthroat cannot reproduce successfully in most of the high lakes. They need a gravel bottom and running water. However, many of the lakes have brook trout and a few lake trout in them. These are left over from stockings long ago and brook trout and lake trout can successfully reproduce in many of the high lakes. Over the last seven or eight years, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has also been experimenting with stocking exotic species in the high lakes, things like grayling and golden trout and tiger trout. The cutthroat and brookies can grow large in the high lakes under ideal situations, they can exceed 20 inches in length, and they live about twice as long in still water as they do in running water because they don't have to fight that current all the time. Okay, let's talk about some strategies for the high lakes. You know, there are actually a lot of similarities between fishing rivers and lakes at least in the way that you fish. After all, trout do respond to stimuli such as water temperature and light in the same manner, whether the water is still or it's flowing. However, there are some major differences that I wanna stress. In rivers, the water is moving and the fish are predominantly stationary. That makes it easy to locate holding water for trout. However, in lakes, the water is stationary and the fish are constantly moving. To the novice, the entire lake can appear to be holding water, making it difficult to locate the trout. Understanding the movement of trout in high lakes then is the key to successfully fishing them. I wanna repeat that because this is important. Understanding the movement of trout in high lakes is the key to successful fishing. And trout in high lakes move in response to several variables, the most important of which is water temperature. And water temperature is a function of the season of the year, as well as the elevation. Generally, the higher you get, the colder the lakes become. Now, Parks and Wildlife realized this relationship between water temperature and elevation many decades ago. They devised the simple classification system for high mountain lakes. And I'd like to introduce this to you because I use it as a framework for my strategy for fishing high mountain lakes. There are three categories. Low elevation lakes are those lakes below 10,000 feet, 
Middle elevation lakes occur between 10,000 feet and timberline, and the high elevation lakes are found above timberline on the tundra. Let's talk first about the low elevation lakes. They have relatively warm water temperatures. Water temperature along shore can exceed 65 degrees during the summer. This is outside of the comfort range of trout, and so they'll move away from the shores into the deeper, colder centers of the lake, making them very difficult to reach with a fly rod from shore, unless, of course, you have a belly boat. However, spin fishermen using a, a fly in a bubble with their longer casting distance will often hook more trout during summer. Low elevation lakes often have an abundance of rooted plants and they can have blue-green algal blooms by the end of summer and they're fed by permanent streams. High elevation lakes on the opposite end of the spectrum can be found above timberline and cirques. They have very cold water temperatures. The water temperature along shore rarely exceeds 60 degrees during the summer and what this means is that trout will be cruising shore the entire open water season. High elevation lakes also have little rooted vegetation and they're fed by snowmelt and groundwater instead of inflowing streams. Middle elevation lakes have a combination of characteristics and about two thirds or so of the high lakes in Colorado fall in this category. Let's talk about the seasonal strategies that I employ or employ during the course of the year. I start out fishing the low elevation lakes as early as they start to ice out and I'll fish out, I'll fish them with the ice out tactics that I'll describe in a, in a little bit of time. And this is indicated by the red X there. I will move upward in elevation as progressively higher elevation lakes ice out and, and fish that ice out there at middle elevation lakes and will continue to fish the middle elevation lakes as the summer hatches start to happen. I'll move those, I'll move upward in elevation following those hatches to the higher elevation lakes on the tundra, usually about mid July or so. And I'll fish there the rest of the uh, summer season. Come about the third week or so of September, the lakes start to chill and you start to lose the hatches. I'll move downward in elevation following the last remaining hatches and eventually end up at the lower elevation lakes, fishing the last of the hatches and then fishing ice out tactics as the lakes start to freeze up in autumn. So let's talk about ice out strategies. After a lake thaws and turns over, slow, solar radiation will differentially warm the surface and near shore waters. Hungry fish will move into these waters looking for food. This is the classic ice out situation. Many of these fish have been under ice for seven months or more and they're ravenous. This is the time of the year when you can catch some of the biggest brookies and of course, hungry cutthroat as well. But ice out only lasts about two to two and a half weeks or so at a given lake, and it'll end when the cutthroats start to spawn and they'll become reluctant to strike. Also, the brookies will then move into deeper water as near shore temperatures warm. I pursue trout during ice out with a fly rod and a full sinking line, not a sinking tip line, a full sinking line, and I prefer type five and type six. These are lines that will sink at five inches or six inches per second. My favorite patterns are a black marabou leech or a black woolly bugger. I also fish royal coachman streamers and white rabbit leeches, particularly for brook trout, which are attracted to white. And I'll fish orange soft hackles and wet flies as well. However, most people fish high lakes during the summer. And this is a time where you can get into the upper elevations and enjoy the spectacular scenery, as well as catch some beefy cutthroat on dry flies. We talked about trout in high lakes moving about in response to water temperature. 
but they also move about in response to insect hatches. For example, trout will move closer to shore in order to catch those caddisflies that may be dropping out of the willows that line shore. Also, trout may move out into the deeper centers of the lakes pursuing midges that are hatching. Midges tend to live in this finer grained sediment that's found in deeper water. So let's talk about the entomology on high lakes because it's different from what you would see on lower elevation streams and rivers. Midges are the predominant hatch that you'll find. They're ubiquitous, they occur at all elevations. You'll find midges as the first hatch when the lakes ice out in the spring. They'll be the last insect to hatch before the lakes ice up in autumn. You can fish the larva, pupa, and adult, but you mostly fish the pupa and the adult. Caddisflies are important. However, they don't form the blanket hatches that you will find on lower elevation rivers like the Arkansas. However, they are a high calorie source of food, so trout will opportunistically feed on them. Mayflies are different on the high lakes. You'll find mostly calabatus below timberline and gray drakes above timberline. And then during midsummer, you got the terrestrials. You'll have ants, beetles, and small hoppers. And throughout the year, in some lakes, you can find leeches and scuds. Obviously, the key to successfully fishing the hatches is to correctly identify the insect, but it's also really important to identify the stage of the insect, that is, whether it's a nymph, a pupa, or an adult. And this can be done by looking at the rise form that the trout leaves. Now this rainbow that I have highlighted with an arrow is feeding on an active adult insect. It creates a very splashy rise form. Its snout, its head, and sometimes the entire length of the fish will leap, break the surface of the water. Now this splashy rise form should not be confused with the rise form that is left by this cutthroat that is feeding a few inches below the surface on emergers. Its head will not break the surface. You may see the dorsal fin and or the tail breaking the surface, but not the head. Fish that are feeding on emergers, maybe a foot or more below the surface, won't have any part of the trout that's penetrating the surface water, but often they'll leave a bulge on the surface. And this is caused by the trout rising in the water column and compressing the water overlying it. We we'll also have this colorful cutthroat here, which is feeding on midge pupa that are suspended in the surface film. It's just sipping these pupa and it leaves this little telltale dimple. If you have a lot of these fish that are feeding simultaneously, it may look like it's raining. Let me talk about some of my favorite patterns for the adult caddis. I don't think you can beat the typical elk hair caddis in a size 14 to 16. For adult calabatus and gray drakes, number 12 to 16, atoms and mosquitoes. Adult midges can be imitated with number 18 through 20, black gnats and black parachutes. And then I like to carry along a lot of number 16 orange ashers. This can be my go-to pattern when trout are feeding on adult midges. For emerging caddis, a number 14 gold rib hair's ear works well, and for emerging calabatus, a number 14 pheasant tail works. For midge pupa and midge emergers, there's a variety of different patterns. Those patterns above the stick are to be fished in the film, and those patterns below the stick are to be fished a few inches below the surface. Now, when you're fishing midge emergers on a fly rod, you can fish them as a dropper off of a dry fly, or you can fish them with an indicator. And I rig very similar to how I would rig if I was short line nymphing a tailwater or a freestone. 
I usually leave a distance of about five feet between the indicator and the point fly, and then I'll vary this distance depending on where the fish are feeding. This technique works a lot better when there is a chop on the surface because it moves those nymphs around. You can also fish midge emergers by stripping them quickly in the film. I often do this with an orange asher and it can produce some violent strikes, even though all the surrounding fish may be gently sipping these midge pupa. We talked about trout in high lakes moving about in response to water temperature and insect hatches, but they also move about in response to light intensity. Trout more actively feed under dim light, such as at dawn or dusk, and cloudy days are also really good for finding feeding trout. Trout will also move about in the lake in response to temporary cover. That could be the shade from overhanging tree branches, or it may be the shadow on the lake that's cast by the cirque at the end of the day. Trout will also let down their guard and move closer to shore under a rippled or choppy surface. So wind on high lakes is an angler's friend. So don't forget my two books, Fly Fishing Colorado's Backcountry, which contains strategies for high lakes and small streams, and then the fishing guide to 800 high lakes in Colorado for where to fish. Both of these lake, or both of these books can be purchased through a link on my website. So I want to thank you very much for watching this presentation and have fun fishing in the Colorado backcountry.